So hello, thank you for joining us today. We will start in a few minutes to allow other person to join us. Thank you for holding. Welcome everyone. We are very excited and happy to have you join our third Morocco AI webinar of this 2022 AI webinar series. A brief intro about Morocco AI and who we are. We are an initiative led by AI experts in Morocco and abroad. These experts are professors, researchers, and AI professionals. Our main mission is to promote AI growth in Morocco and build a strong collaborative AI community, both locally and abroad. We have launched different activities such as AI webinar series. The AI webinar series aims to bring AI researchers to present and share their work with the community. For today's webinar, Erdogan and I will be your hosts. I will let Erdogan introduce himself. Hi, hello everyone, and uh, Ramadan Mubarak Karim. Uh, my name is Redouan Gensat. I'm a research engineer at Institut Pierre Simon Laplace. It's a climate uh, modeling center. And happy to be here with you today and very looking forward to Sana's talk. Thank you, everyone. And I am Iman Khuja. I am a data scientist in NLP. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, and join our community on Slack to be notified about our upcoming webinars and other activities. In this third webinar of 2022, Sana will be presenting the promises and pitfalls of the margin of likelihood. Sana Lotfi is a PhD student at New York University and a Deep Mind Fellow. Working with Professor Andrew Gordon Wilson, she is currently interested in understanding and quantifying the generalization of deep learning models. Before joining New York University, Sana obtained a master's degree in applied mathematics from Polytechnic Montreal, where she worked on designing stochastic first and second order algorithms for machine learning and large-scale optimization. She also holds an engineering degree in general engineering and applied mathematics from Centrale Supelic. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them on the chat on Zoom or YouTube, and we'll make sure to bring them up at the end of the presentation. And please be sure to stick around for our networking session right after the presentation, where we will break out in the smaller rooms so you get to meet and talk with some of the attendees. The presentation will last for approximately 40 minutes followed by 10 minutes Q&As. And without further ado, Sana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Very happy to be here. Very happy to talk about the marginal likelihood today. So let's, let's start. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, perfect, we can see your screen. Great, okay, so happy to present today on the promises and the pitfalls of the marginal likelihood. Uh, this is a recent work that uh, I just did with my uh, colleagues, Pavel Ismailov, Grigory Benton, Micah Goldblum, and my advisor, Andrew Golden Wilson. So today we'll be talking about the promises of the, and the pitfalls of the marginal likelihood for model selection. So let's start, first of all, by understanding what is Bayesian learning. Let's say some, someone suggests that you play a game where uh, they will flip a coin 100 times, you will get $1 for each time it comes head, and you should pay $40 to participate. Will you play or not? So the answer to this question will be different whether you are playing with your sweet grandma or one-eyed Jack. This is because you know that one of them is very nice, it's impossible that she's going to trick you into something, into some game it's impossible to win. And you know, the other one is known for tricking people. So the Bayesian framework is a framework where you can encode this prior knowledge and at the same time, take into account the evidence that you get from the data. So first of all, in the Bayesian framework, you know, you need to know what is your data and how you are going to encode it. Let's introduce here a random variable X that takes one if you get ahead 
zero if you get a tail. So here, basically, the probability that x is one is w. This is the probability of heads, nothing crazy here. Then the probability of tails is just one minus w, and that's because the probability should sum up to one. So very basic. Now, let's say you obtained a series of results, head, tail, head, head, tail. So you would encode that as one, zero, one, one. A very important notion in the Bayesian framework is the notion of the likelihood. This notion says, okay, how likely it is, is it to obtain my data under this model and under these parameters? So it's the probability of D, of this data set that you just observed, head, tail, head, head, tail, and uh, given W, given the probability of head in this framework. And because here you are observing some observations that are independent, it's just the product of the probabilities of the observations. The details are not important. It's more important to understand the notion of the likelihood, which is the probability of your data set under a certain model and under that model's parameters. All right, so now you want to encode your prior knowledge. How would you encode your prior knowledge? You would like to place a prior over the probability of heads. So one of the very popular uh, choices in this case is the beta distribution because it has a direct interpretation. The hyperparameters alpha and beta can be interpreted as the number of heads for alpha and the number of tails for beta. And um, to make this clear, we are trying to say, okay, what, what do I think before seeing any data that the probability of heads will be. Remember that you get a dollar for each head you see. So if you think that that person is tricking you, the probability of heads will be lower so that they give you less money, right? So here, if you choose some parameter, some values of the parameters alpha and beta, you can end up with different distributions. Okay, for your grandma, you know, she's sweet, she's nice. So you think that the probability of head of, of head is 0 0.5. It's equally likely to get heads and tails. She's not going to trick you. At the same time, you're accounting for some probability around 0 0.5 because maybe she has an unfair coin. Someone gave it to her. But when I jack that guy, you think like you heard that he's tricking people, right? So you know that he's likely to have an unfair coin where the probability of head is actually lower. So the probability of head is 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Once he flips the coin, it's gonna be more tails than heads. In this way, he gives you more money and you paid $40 to participate, they are all gone. So now this is a framework where you can directly inject this knowledge that you have. Prior knowledge, you're just defining prior over your, your uh, parameters. Now you have new evidence, you have new information that arrives. You tell them, okay, I can decide blindly. You should flip the coin 10 times each so that I can decide whether or not to play. Grandma flips the coin 10 times. She obtains two heads, eight tails. Jack obtains five heads, five tails. Now, the evidence is kind of telling that it, it's grandma that might be cheating here, right? But you want actually to still take into account your prior knowledge to just update it as you get more evidence. You don't want to throw away the prior knowledge that you had. So how do we update our distribution. Now, very important theorem in the Bayesian framework, which is the Bayes theorem. The Bayes theorem just states that the posterior is, uh, is, approximately, is um, approximately the likelihood multiplied by the prior, and there is a normalization constant that we removed here, but it's, it's not very important uh, for now. So you know that, that the posterior is the, your posterior distribution is what you get after updating your prior, and you're going to take into account the likelihood. So this is a very nice way to include the prior knowledge you had, what you're seeing from the data. In a very um, abstract way, what this does is you start with a prior hypothesis space, which what, what you see here, a large hypothesis space. And then as you see more data, you start contracting around the true model. So your posterior is more contracted around the model. Your prior hypothesis space has many possible explanations. As you see more data, it becomes more contracted. Now, if we want to visualize that, it would look something like this. You have two priors, one, one strong, one weak. After getting a few updates, you see that the weak prior starts to get contracted around the value that is most probably the real value, and you see that, okay, getting more data actually helps you concentrate around what is the actual class of function instead of 
taken into account a lot of functions. All right, so you got that information, you updated your prior using that information. Now your posterior distribution looks a little bit different. Uh, the posterior distribution is also a beta distribution in this case, because this is what we call conjugate prior. So uh, you end up with a similar distribution, but not the same hyperparameter. So you see that alpha and beta, the prior value that we chose was 100 for grandma. You saw two heads, eight tails. You can see that our prior was very strong. So even though we, we have some evidence that grandma might have an unfair coin, but still, we see that the posterior is still all almost concentrated around 0 0.5. But here is the interesting thing, is that the probability for one-eyed Jack was leaning heavily towards an unfair coin that is more towards giving tails than heads. And now it's starting to get closer to 0 0.5 because we had evidence that he might not be cheating. He might have a fair coin. So this is these are the main components of a Bayesian framework. You have prior knowledge, you see some data, you update that knowledge. In the updated version of your prior distribution is what we call the posterior distribution. So we had P of W, now you have P of W given the, given the data. This, this slash means that given the data, we have seen the data, now we are updating our belief about what the true model is. Now, okay, one of the in, important questions either in the Bayesian framework or in machine learning in general is, how do you pick these hyperparameters? How would you pick alpha and beta? You know, in the beginning, I just took the assumptions. We trust grandma. We don't trust one IJAC. We just defined alpha and beta. But it's important actually to pick these hyperparameters. So one of the things that the marginal likelihood, the title of our talk, helps with is picking alpha and beta. Another thing more generally is to choose between models. We have prior hypotheses. We have some prior uh, assumptions. Uh, a bunch of them, and we don't know which one to choose. We don't know which one is true. So the marginal likelihood, the big question is whether or not it's going to help us choose the right model among a selection of models. So we're done with the uh, initial example. Now we're going to talk more generally about what is Bayesian learning. So in Bayesian learning, instead of bidding everything on one model, on one W, we consider a prior over all possible Ws, a prior distribution. We have a likelihood after seeing the data, and we obtain a posterior that just the prior updated after seeing the data. And here, what you see here, the Bayesian weighted, uh, the posterior weighted Bayesian model averaging, what we call the BMA, is just averaging over all that posterior possibility. So instead of taking one possibility, one neural network weight, weights or uh, one set of weights, you are considering all possible weights, but with the distribution here. And if you're familiar with standard training in deep learning, standard training actually optimizes to find one value of the weights, which is the maximum a posterior point. And uh, what you can see here, the first term, P of D given W, the likelihood is usually uh, minus the loss that we optimize in uh, neural networks. And the log of the prior is usually what you considered your regularization term. So there is a direct connection between the two frameworks, except standard training bits everything on one possibility. OK, now what is the marginal likelihood, the thing we care about most? The marginal likelihood or the evidence is the probability that we would generate a data set with a model if we were to randomly sample from a prior over its parameters. So mathematically speaking, this object is basically the integral over your likelihood given into account all the possibilities from your prior space weighted according to your prior distribution. So it's the probability that you would generate the data set that you are seeing if you were to sample randomly from your prior. And we usually use the log marginal likelihood instead of the marginal likelihood just for numerical reasons. So I will refer to that in the presentation as LML. OK, question of interest. What do we care about again? What we care about is how do we select between theories and models that are entirely consistent with any data that we are observing? So to make this more concrete, say you have five models that you trained on uh, a certain data set. They might be all neural networks with different architectures. They might be one of them is a neural network, one of them is logistic regression, different models. How do you pick the one that's not only doing well on the data set that you're looking at right now, but is going to be doing well for future data that you will see. So when we train neural network, uh, 
we don't we care about it doing well right now on this data but the most important question is how will it do on unseen data that we have not seen yet and the marginal likelihood can be an answer to this question in certain cases so in this talk i will first of all make the case for the marginal likelihood when it's a plausible tool to answer this question and i will also examine the pitfalls of the marginal likelihood when actually it's likely not to be the right tool to answer this question and why and finally i will introduce one of the remedies a partial remedy that uh, we have in our work that can fix the, some of the issues that we see with the marginal likelihood okay let's go for the case for the marginal likelihood what is good for in model selection here we see a bunch of boxes in a tree and my question to all of you is how many boxes are behind the tree i'll give you a few seconds to think about it do you think it's likely to have one box behind the tree, two, more than two boxes? Okay, most of us probably will predict that there is one box behind the tree. And that's because it would be a remarkable coincidence for two boxes to just be the same height, the same color, be close to each other and be hidden by the tree. That's gonna be a really interesting coincidence. That's not what we expect usually. In this intuition that we have as human beings, it's what we call Occam's razor. The Occam's razor means that, states that we should accept the simplest explanation that fits the data. There is no reason to complicate things when there is a simple explanation that is actually consistent with what we see in the real world. So here, here there is a funny example where this guy named Occam has a beard. And one of the one of the characters here talks to the other one and be like, and he's like, okay, look at him. He has a silly beard. He probably lost his razor. And the other person goes like, well, I don't think so. Maybe he just likes that look. And yeah, it's simpler to just think that he chose that than to come up with a complicated explanation, right? That's exactly Occam's razor. And for the record, William of Occam didn't have a beard. So it's more likely that that's not the right explanation, right? And that's also why, not why it's called Occam's razor. So I don't know why I couldn't get to the bottom of it, but there it is. Okay, why do we care about this principle? Why does it make sense? And why do we want intelligent system that we're building with machine learning to embody it? What is the beauty or the, um, say the interesting thing about a neural network embodying Occam's razor? We have three arguments. The first one is beauty. Uh, to quote Paul Dirac, a theory with mathematical beauty is more likely to be correct than an ugly one that fits some experimental data. And we see this, like if you have a function that's very wiggly and does just fit in your experimental data, or um, we, if we have a general framework and just a special case is what fits your data, then you are more likely to choose the general framework for its mathematical beauty. And it seems that this argument is very famous among pure mathematicians. I've been reading lately a book by Hardy called A Mathematician's Apology. And one of the things that he put forward and helped, uh, and helped British mathematics with is this mathematical rigor and beauty. So that's one of the arguments. The, the other one is past empirical success. It seems that in the history of science, we have found as human beings that the simplest explanations were more likely to be true. And finally, very importantly, and very relevant for this talk, is that coherent Bayesian inference does automatically embody this Occam's razor and not in some vague way, exactly mathematically embody it. And more specifically, the marginal likelihood, the objective of this talk actually embodies Occam's razor. So let's understand how. First of all, let's look at this graph that we have here on the x-axis uh, in this figure. In the x-axis, you have the data sets, the possible data sets that the, the model is supposed to uh, cover. Here, H1 and H2 refer to hypothesis one and hypothesis two, but you can also read them as model one and model two. Evidence is the other name for the marginal likelihood. And you can see that one very interesting feature is that H1 is covering list data sets. It can explain list data sets that we observe in the real world, but it's more peak than H2. And that's because the evidence is a normalized probability density. So it has to spread its mass exactly on the data sets that it's covering. So if H2 is able to cover more examples, then its mass is going to have to spread more thinly. So in for any data set that falls within C1, 
H1 will have a higher evidence for that data set, so a higher marginal likelihood. In other words, the more constrained model here, which is H1, covering the data set that we care about, which should fall within C1, wins. And this encodes an Occam's razor. The reason why this encodes an Occam's razor is that H1 here is very likely to be a simpler model because it's covering less explanations of the data. So it's simpler, but it has higher evidence. And this is just coming from the fact that the normalized probability density should sum up to one. So this is a very exact way in which the marginal likelihood does embody Occam's razor. Now let's talk about one example where we can see this, um, where we can see the marginal likelihood helping us for hypothesis testing very clearly. One of the examples here is um, Mercury's orbit. So Newtonian theory uh, did predict that for most of the planets, the orbit will be elliptical, and that's coming from direct application to Kepler laws, but it failed to explain this discrepancy in the orbit of Mercury. So the orbit of Mercury would advance by almost 40, uh, 43 arc seconds every century. Um, just for people who don't know what arc seconds are, one arc second is one over 3,600 uh, degrees. So basically just an angle by which Mercury advances and it's extremely precise. So each century we would notice that there is an advancement of this Mercury's orbit that the Newtonian theory is not able to explain, at least the way it was. But at the time, Einstein's Newtonian theory was able to predict this difference. So now we have two hypotheses. Hypothesis one is Einstein's general relativity theory that is able to predict this discrepancy. And the other one is some fudged variant of Newtonian theory. So some people really kept holding, some scientists kept holding to the Newtonian theory. And what they said is that it just needs some adjustment. We just need to adjust Newton's law of gravity so that it fits the data we're observing with the Mercury example. So which hypothesis would you choose as a scientist? You need some some strong, powerful theory to base your decision on. You can just choose one or the other. And here the marginal likelihood will be helpful to choose between the two. So one of the uh, distributions that we usually use to encode or model different phenomena is the Gaussian distribution. So we can place the Gaussian distribution over the value of the deviation, how much we're deviating from what we would predict, which is the elliptical orbit. So for uh, H1, for, the, for Einstein's general relativity, we can make the mean of this Gaussian distribution equal to what it predicted. So general relativity predicted directly, that's gonna be 42.9 uh, arc seconds per century, and that's what we plug in as the mean. And for the standard deviation, we will uh, decide about that from like as prior knowledge uh, in advance. The other case, which is H2, uh, which is just some adjustment to Newton's theory. In that case, we can't plug in just a mean because we're not we, we we're not sure about what to predict as the mean of that Gaussian distribution. We are still trying to adjust that theory to the observations that we're seeing. So we should accommodate for a, a very large set of possibilities. This is why instead of just directly plugging in a mean, we will place a Gaussian distribution, a Gaussian prior over the mean and marginalize out. So I will spare you the details. We can go over them if you're interested. But uh, after doing all of this, we obtain the following formula for the marginal likelihood for this hypothesis. And now we end up with something that looks like this. We see that the marginal likelihood for hypothesis one which is um, Einstein's general relativity, is more peaked than, uh, than the Newtonian theory. And that is coming from a very simple observation, which is that Einstein's theory is not accommodating for a lot of possibilities. It's telling us exactly how much deviation we're going to have. So it's actually peaked. That's the data set it's accounting for. Whereas for Newtonian theory, we should accommodate for all possibilities, for all adjustments. So it has to spread itself more thinly. Now let's talk about the value that we get with some uh, with some like assumptions and hypotheses. We get that the ratio of p d given h1 over p uh, d given h2 favors general relativity. So this ratio is more than one, and uh, this is a possible explanation. Uh, this is the possible explanation that was. 
later favored by scientists. But you can see here that the marginal likelihood directly allows us to choose between hypothesis one and hypothesis two. And more importantly, it favors the theory that we do think based on other different uh, evidence as well, that is the true uh, theory. So it was later explained that due to some space-time curvature around the sun, we end up with this orbit and that general relativity is right to uh, have this prediction. At least this is the best explanation that we have for now. Okay, moving on. Another thing that the marginal likelihood helps with is hyperparameter learning. So GPs or Gaussian processes are an example in this case. To give a brief idea about Gaussian processes, there are distributions over functions that are defined by their mean and covariance matrix. So instead of placing a prior over parameters, we are placing a prior over functions. And as you can see here, um, this allows us to account for uncertainty. So instead of just um, modeling predictions, we are also modeling the uncertainty around predictions. So you can see from the figure that in places where we have data points or as we get more data points, we have less uncertainty. But in regions where we don't have data points, we have high uncertainty. And this is actually what you would expect from a good model to give, right? In regions where you don't have a lot of points, there is no reason for you to be overconfident about your predictions. So we're trying to do as best as we can for predictions, but we're also trying to have an uncertainty that covers all possibilities that we're not aware of. And uh, just to say that one defining property of Gaussian processes is that uh, any the marginal distribution for any subset of uh, data points is a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so let's consider concretely a Gaussian process. A common choice for the uh, covariance matrix is the RBF kernel. And uh, here the, the RBF kernel or kernels in general are measuring some kind of similarity between two data points, x and x prime. So what's very important to focus on in this example is this length scale parameter. It's a hyperparameter of this kernel. And basically it allows us to control the flexibility of this function. So you can see, for example, that if you pick this hyperparameter to be very large, say, think about the limit case. If it's tending towards infinity, you can see that you will need the distance between x and x prime to be very large for you to see any difference in the function space on the kernel. Whereas from the other side, if L is too small, then any small difference between X and X prime is gonna show directly in your function space. So to be more concrete with this, you can look at this graph. You can see that for L equal to one, very small value, the function is very wiggly. So basically this function is very flexible. If you, get it, if you give it some data points, it can almost fit it exactly even fit in the noise. But as you increase the value of L, it becomes 20, 60, you can see that the function becomes much less flexible. So basically it controls how much flexibility you have. So this is a very strong hyperparameter for Gaussian processes. And what's very interesting about the marginal likelihood is that it's able to find a good fit for this hyperparameter. So if you choose this hyperparameter, the length scale, such as it maximizes the marginal likelihood, it provides a much better fit than even standard course validation, which is what's usually used in uh, machine learning for finding hyperparameters for different models. So here you can see that we have an appropriate model with the right kind of flexibility. We have a model that's very flexible and another one that's very simple. And you find that the marginal likelihood based on the property that we discussed before, like just having the mass spreaded nicely over the possible data sets does choose the right model. So that's another win for the marginal likelihood. And another good thing is that it's, it's able to help us choose between discrete models. So in deep neural networks, there are a lot of approximations of the marginal likelihood that, um, that were suggested in recent papers. And one of them is the Laplace approximation. And I am referencing here Emmer and all, in their work, they show that um, the marginal likelihood here is on the x-axis, and they use the Laplace approximation to compute it. On the y-axis, you have the test accuracy, and you can see actually that the marginal likelihood is aligned with the test accuracy, which means that if the marginal likelihood tells you that model A is better than model B, it's probably aligned with the test accuracy. That's also the model that's going to be good for your future data. So this is another win for the marginal likelihood. 
the marginal likelihood is good for hypothesis testing, hyperparameter learning, and discrete model comparison between discrete neural networks. Now, it's not all butterflies and rainbows. The marginal likelihood has many pitfalls. And these pitfalls are coming from the fact that even in the previous examples, we were considering that the marginal likelihood is directly aligned with generalization. And that is not always true. Let's see that in detail. So let's consider a simple example, which is a density estimation example. Here we are sampling X from a Gaussian distribution with mean U, standard deviation one. In the mean U, we are also placing a prior distribution that is Gaussian over that uh, mean mu, prior variance sigma squared. And here we are looking at the marginal likelihood, the test log likelihood, the predictive mean, and the predictive variance. Very important observation here is that you see that the marginal likelihood becomes worse as you increase the prior variance. It peaks at some value and then it gets worse and worse. From the other side, the test log likelihood, the predictive mean and the predictive variance becomes stable starting a certain value of the prior variance. So what does this mean? This means that the marginal likelihood might hate a model because it has a very high prior variance, whereas it makes absolutely zero difference for the predictive model. Your future predictions, your test predictions, whatever you want, they will not be affected by that prior variance, but the marginal likelihood is still hating it. So the marginal likelihood is not generalization. And this is very dangerous because you can break the marginal likelihood using the sensitivity to the prior. So very concretely here, M, uh, MML is uh, the maximum marginal likelihood model, basically the best fit that you can obtain. And we consider two other models, M1 and M2. M1 here, you can see that it's in pink. It's aligned with the best possible model that you can obtain. M2 is not so great, but you can see that the marginal likelihood actually is higher for M2. Why does it prefer M2? Simply because M1 has a very high prior variance, which is 10 to 6. And that is bothering the marginal likelihood, but you can see from the figure that it's making absolutely zero difference for the predictive distribution. And that's the problem with the marginal likelihood. This sensitivity to the prior opens a lot of doors to break it and make it not aligned with generalization. So what went wrong? A theoretical explanation is that the posterior uh, weighted BMA is weighted over the posterior distribution, P of W given, given D here in the first integral. So basically, you are taking into account a distribution that is a posterior distribution, one that is updated, updated after seeing the data, whereas the marginal likelihood is marginalized with respect to the prior. So it makes complete sense that the marginal likelihood is more sensitive to the prior hyperparameters, the objective over which we marginalize directly, than the posterior BMA, because the posterior BMA is marginalized over something that's already updated, so less sensitive to the prior hyperparameters. Another explanation is that simply there are two different questions. The marginal likelihood is not answering the generalization question. Here you can see that the marginal likelihood actually answers the question, what is the probability that a prior model generated the data? Given a prior model, we're just asking, okay, what is the probability that it generated the data? Whereas generalization is a completely different question. So the generalization question is, how likely is the posterior conditioned on the training data to have generated withhold points from the same distribution? So we care about future data points and we condition on the training data. Whereas the marginal likelihood is just asking, what is the probability that a prior model prior model, not condition on the data, generated the data. So they are simply asking two different questions. That's why the marginal likelihood sometimes is not aligned with generalization. And another reason we go wrong is that the marginal likelihood penalizes diffuse priors heavily. You can see here that uh, if you remember from the graph, we say that the more spread a prior is, the more it has to spread its mass. So the lower marginal likelihood it has, so here in this case, the marginal likelihood will pick prior A because it's less diffuse. But the problem is once we see the data, prior A contracts less than prior C. Prior C contracts very fast and faster contraction means better generalization. So basically it's penalizing priors too heavily and not taking into account the fact that we update them 
after seeing the data and that actually some priors can be even better after seeing the data. And another problem with the marginal likelihood is that it can overfit. So let's go back to Gaussian processes. Let's consider the Gaussian process with the RBF kernel. And now we are going to give the marginal likelihood a lot of flexibility to play with. So now we're not just tuning the length scale that the marginal likelihood gets right. We're also going to parameterize the mean function with a multi-layer perceptron, meaning a NOR network that gives it a lot of flexibility. So you can see the results here. You can see that the lift figure is a case where we considered a fixed mean. And you can see that for the new data points, which are the crosses, uh, the round data points are the training data and the test data points are the crosses. You can see that for those crosses, the marginal likelihood is covering them with the uncertainty. So you would expect them to fall there, right? But when we are giving the mean a lot of flexibility, it's actually overfitting. The marginal likelihood is overfitting. So you can see that the uncertainty in the figure to the, to the right-hand side is not covering at all the test points, the new points. So here, the marginal likelihood is overfitting in providing poor overconfident predictions outside the train region. And this is because we gave it a lot of flexibility. At the end of the day, we should keep in mind that the marginal likelihood is just a likelihood. And we know the likelihood can overfit. So if we are giving the marginal likelihood a lot of flexibility, then there is a chance that it's going to overfit to the data points. So these are the main problems with the marginal likelihood. It's not aligned with generalization. It can overfit. And also, if you check our paper, we also talk about a case where it can underfit. So what is the solution? What, what can we do? First of all, let's try to understand even more what goes wrong in detail. Uh, to do that, we are going to look at the decomposition of the marginal likelihood. So another way to write the marginal likelihood, if you have some data points here, di means data point number i and uh, data point i. And uh, D less than I means all the previous data points. So basically the marginal likelihood can be written as the sum of the predictive log likelihoods at data point D I given all the previous data points. So we are saying, okay, haven't seen all data points before I, what is our predictive distribution for D I? This is a possible decomposition. To talk more in detail about this decomposition, how it manifests itself, let's go back to the density estimation example. So just a reminder, we are sampling X from a Gaussian distribution. The mean is sampled in turn from another Gaussian distribution. And here, uh, the plot to the left is where we showed that M1, the model that's, not, that's, that's being unfairly and favored by the marginal likelihood um, is there. And we can see on the right-hand plot uh, those predictive distribution elements. So P of the N given all previous data points. And here, um, the marginal likelihood is the area under the curve. It's just the sum of all these elements, right? And you can see here that M1 is penalized by the early term. So if you look at this graph, if you look at this figure closely, you can see that M1 is starting from very low. M2 is not starting from such a low value. And this is because M1 is very diffuse, if you remember. M1 has a very big prior variance. So basically, M1 is very diffuse. It's starting from a very low predictive value, but it catches up very quickly. And it's as good as the best model, but the marginal likelihood doesn't care. So whatever penalty M1 incurred early on, it keeps with it because the marginal likelihood is the area under the curve. It's the sum of all of those. So the problem here is that for data points one, two, three, maybe up to two, three, here, like it's just a few data points at the beginning. We can see that M1 because very diffuse, because it's very diffuse, it's been heavily penalized, but it doesn't get rid of this penalty, even though it's able to catch up. M2 from the other side is not nearly as good as M1 or M or the best possible model. And it continues to be suboptimal. But because it's not starting from a place as bad as M1, it's still favored by the marginal likelihood. So what do we do with this observation? An idea is, why don't we just ignore those first M terms? Those M terms are coming, are just incurring some penalty early on, and that penalty is being carried on for all data points, whereas that's not what we care about. What we care about is, what is our prediction having seen all those data points? 
So here in our work, we suggest to use the conditional marginal likelihood as a replacement for the marginal likelihood for uh, all uh, purposes of the marginal likelihood. So basically we define the conditional marginal likelihood to be um, the later term starting from n, uh, from m. So from i equal to m to n, we're just removing the first m terms, m minus one here, removing the first m minus one terms and looking at the rest of that. So that translates in the figure to the right by just ignoring that part where M1 was not catching up. And considering, say, after five data points, considering the area under the curve after that. And in that case, you would see that the conditional marginal likelihood would favor M1. And that's the right thing to do in this case, right? And uh, just to explain this in terms of posterior contraction, here we are kind of defining a marginal likelihood, but over the posterior after C and M data points. So basically we are taking into account the capacity of the model to contract after C and some data points, right? And that's the insight from this work. The partial remedy to the marginal likelihood is that you can just ignore those first terms and do much better because you are addressing all those issues in the marginal likelihood. So let's look at some experimental results. We considered, first of all, some NAR networks with cipher 10 data set. And in the paper, you can also find results for cipher. Uh, we're considering here cipher 100, but you can find on the paper cipher 10 as well. And we're looking at the correlation between these two notions, conditional marginal likelihood, marginal likelihood, and the Bayesian model average and test accuracy. And what we change here in different figures is the prior precision, or in other words, for those people who are familiar with training deep neural networks, this is the regularization parameter. So here we are looking at the, the marginal likelihood in, in the figure uh, to the left and to the right, we're looking at the conditional marginal likelihood. And so could, the, you, could you please wrap up in five minutes? Thank you. Yeah, sure. So Thanks. the conditional marginal likelihood, you can see here that it's better aligned with generalization. Uh, row here uh, represents the correlation coefficient. And you can see that it's much better correlated with the BMA test accuracy. So this means that the conditional marginal likelihood is better predicting generalization. The other uh, example of models that are very flexible that we tried this on is deep kernel learning. So to explain this very briefly, uh, deep kernel learning bring the best of Gaussian processes in neural networks. So basically we use a neural network to map the inputs to an intermediate feature space and then feed that to Gaussian processes. And now we can train the parameters of the neural network and the parameters of the kernel jointly. So you can see here from the results that the conditional marginal likelihood is better uh, in terms for these three data sets, Boston, Wine, and Concrete. You can see that the uh, mean squared error, the RMSE here, is better for the conditional marginal likelihood. And this is even tr more true for the low data regime. When we have very little data, it's even better to use the conditional marginal likelihood. It might be counterintuitive at the beginning because the conditional marginal likelihood is about removing some terms. So like, okay, if I don't have a lot of data, do I want to remove some terms? It's still better because you're still accounting for some contraction. And another case here is when we are considering transfer learning, uh, you can see that for the classification error, it's lower overall for the conditional marginal likelihood and same for the mean squared error. Okay, concluding remarks. If there is one thing I want you to keep in mind from this talk is don't use the marginal likelihood blindly. There is a more neon story behind the marginal likelihood. It's a very important tool in the Bayesian framework. It can be very useful for selecting different hypotheses, for tuning hyperparameters, it might not overfit, but the story is much more nuanced because the marginal likelihood does not answer the generalization question. There is nothing wrong with it, but it's not generalization. So if you are looking at a, at a bunch of models and you want to select between them, or you want to tune hyperparameters, think really well whether the marginal likelihood is what would allow you to select the model that's gonna do well on future data, if that's your purpose, of course. And maybe you can also consider the conditional marginal likelihood. So that's my next point. Ignoring the first terms of the decomposition uh, as we do in the conditional marginal likelihood is much more aligned with generalization. And 
Finally, an open question that we have in our work is how can we make this new objective, the conditional marginal likelihood, more practical for large scale learning? So we know with deep neural networks, we have a lot of data and it's very large scale. So how can we make this new objective very suitable for this back propagation, all of this? Thank you very much. This is the end of my talk. Uh, you can find the paper on archive. You can find the code online on GitHub. And please, if you have any questions, go ahead. Thank you so much, Sana, for this well-explained presentation about marginal likelihood. We have indeed uh, some questions here to ask from the participants. So uh, I will start with the first one. Uh, here we have participants asking, uh, so ha have, you, have you tried the same study for uh, Gaussian uh, processor using a uh, matern kernel instead of a Gaussian kernel? Matern kernel instead of the Gaussian kernel. So this is just an, ex an illustration. The, process, the purpose was not to make things work for this one. It was the opposite. It was to break things. So this is one of the examples, just some illustration of the fact that it can overfit. Now, I'm pretty sure that if you use a matern kernel and you still give this flexibility to the mean function, it will still overfit because this is too much flexibility, the same way that the, that the likelihood overfits. Any kernel placed here, if you give the mean all that flexibility, it's going to overfit. So I think we looked at a bunch of those kernels though in our uh, work at the beginning to see if like, what are the, pro the potential problems with the marginal likelihood. And I think it doesn't make much difference here what kernel you're using. The punchline here is that if you give a lot of flexibility by using a neural network for the mean, you are going to overfit. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have another question about uh, overfitting. So is, is there a trade-off between uh, overfitting and the data size? If, if we have more, more data, will this, uh, will this make the, the, the model uh, more performant and not to overfit or it doesn't change? Oh, it definitely has an effect. So basically if you have more data points and you are fitting your noise more closely, then that can lead to overfitting. It's going to depend on two things, though. It's going to depend on how flexible your model is. So if I have a model that can't be that flexible from the beginning, then even if I have more data points and I have the ability to fit in the noise, I'm not going to fit it. And the other thing is whether or not I'm regularizing against overfitting my training procedure. So usually in our networks, we add a regularization term, and that prevents from overfitting. That basically just penalizes the weights from being too big. So definitely it has an effect on whether or not you will fit, overfit, or underfit, like how many data points you have, but you can control that. It's, it's, not, it's not a direct uh, consequence. If you're regularizing nicely or the flexibility doesn't allow, then you don't have to overfit. Thank you, Sana, for the clarification. So we have another question about the mean for the function for the Gaussian processes. It, it, I mean, it's always hard to, to choose the mean. So do you know any th technique or any advices to choose the, the mean? So I think usually people either go with a constant mean or zero mean after they uh, standardize the data. I don't think it's a big, I, I haven't seen a lot of people trying to tune the mean, to be honest. the 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 biggest source of flexibility for Gaussian processes is coming from the kernel function. It's the choice of the kernel function that is more, I think has a lot of effect on the, your capacity or the expressivity of your Gaussian process. And I think Rudwan can also talk about this since he's probably more familiar with Gaussian processes than I am. But I think it's the, the choice of the kernel function for sure. And for tuning the hyperparameters for the kernel function, I think that the method of choice right now is the marginal likelihood. And it does not seem to be problematic if you are not tuning the mean. If you're just tuning the hyperparameters of the kernel with the marginal likelihood, as I showed like in previous slides, it does a good job. It does not overfit. It does a nice job selecting the right hyperparameters. So this is this is what I would say. Thank you, Sana. So we saw in the application that the uh, marginal likelihood can help in hyperparameter tuning. So the hyperparameters are learned online or offline? 
so there are two ways you can do this. One of the ways, um, let me show this paper. So this is one of the papers that did a nice job with this. One of the ways you can do this is you train your neural network and then afterwards you can tune your hyperparameters. Another way of doing it is you do it online. You do a few epochs, say five epochs of training your neural network, then you optimize the hyperparameters, then you keep training and you do it online as you go. So it can be used both ways. Thanks, Annette. So we, we will move to the next question. So we, we understood clearly from the presentation that the marginal likelihood that does not match the generalization. generalization. So uh, can, can you speak more about your experience with generalization and what are the ways that we can to achieve uh, such results? Okay, so there are two distinct, I, I would say questions. One of the questions is, okay, how do you achieve good generalization? And the other question is, we don't care about how good the generalization is, we just want to predict it. So with the marginal likelihood, we want to predict it. We want to be able to say, okay, this model will generalize better than this one. The results from this paper say this, but the results from this paper, what is not said is that they had to tune the prior variance to achieve that. Now, in the question of how to achieve good generalization, I would say that in distribution, if you're looking at just data points that are coming from the same distribution, I think that one of the most, maybe the best approaches right now in machine learning is to use some ensembling approach. So there are deep ensembles where you train a bunch of neural networks and you do a kind of average or ensemble afterwards. There are There is uh, another work, uh, a joint work with some of my colleagues that we had submitted to ICML and accepted to ICML last year, which is SPRO, uh, basically just finding a whole volume of low loss and sampling from it, and again, doing some ensembling approach. It seems that ensembling helps with generalization. If you're looking in distribution, it seems that it helps. It also helps if you're looking out of distribution, but out of distribution is a harder problem. Just to explain, out of distribution is when your samples are uh, you have a data distribution that your training samples are coming from, then in the test time, you have a new distribution. And that's very tricky because you have only seen data from one distribution, right? Uh, that's tricky. Seems that ensembling helps. Very active research area. Uh, another work of mine uh, tried to look at out of distribution generalization for Bayesian NOR networks. Don't seem to be doing a great job at it, but we we suggested some remedies. So if you want to look at that paper as well. Um, now, when it comes to prediction generalization, there are a bunch of measures. There is the marginal likelihood, of course, for prediction generalization. Uh, people usually use a validation set that can inform you about that. So a validation set to tune hyperparameters or just inform you about your generalization. Um, there, there are a number of other uh, measures for this, either if you're pre-training or not pre-training, but I think it's still a very important open question as well. Uh, I think in Europe, there are uh, a number of competitions that are trying to predict the number of models according to their generalization. So I would say both are very active research areas right now, but I hope I, I, I mentioned as many resources as possible for people who are interested. Thank you, Sana. Uh, uh, so, so also uh, in your presentation, you mentioned Mercury's orbit. So yeah. the question that comes to our mind is that, is there a relationship between a marginal likelihood and quantum computing? Oh, I wouldn't be able to answer that. I have no idea about quantum computing, to be honest. <laughs> Not even <laughs> the most basic background. So maybe okay. next time. <laughs> okay, so it's an open question. Thank you, Sana. It's an open question. Yes, thank you. So we will we, we end with with the with this question from a participant. So could you tell us more about the DeepMind Fellowship and how to apply? Oh, the DeepMind Fellowship. That's a very good question. I didn't apply to the DeepMind Fellowship. I was suggested by New York University. Um, I don't know how it works exactly for, uh, I think at the PhD level, you need to be nominated by your university and maybe they pick then the nominees. I didn't apply to this at all. I was just informed afterwards that I had the fellowship. But I think at the master's level, you might be able to apply 
I'm not sure about this information. I know that it goes by nomination. So basically, if you're interested in it, maybe you can reach out to a professor and see when the nomination is happening and if they can nominate you. But I would say, at least in my case, it didn't go through application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sana, for this clarification. So uh, I think we ended uh, our Q&A session. And now we can move to the breakout sessions. And, uh, and if you have other questions, you can ask them directly to our speaker in the first uh, breakout session. So first I will uh, just end our stream, YouTube stream, and then we can move to the breakout sessions.